So what I'm not going to talk about is generative AI. This is the one that's kind of in the news at the moment. These are things like OpenAI and MidJourney that people are using for automatically generating things such as images and text. So if you see images like this, of Trump being arrested or the Pope in cool jacket, these are automatically generated by computers. You put in a prompt and the computer will generate the image. And it's quite straightforward to use your own images. Here are a bunch of images that I created myself using a computer at home. What I'm going to talk about instead though is big data. We're all used to things like Google and it is a fantastic tool. But what we have to be aware of is that there's an awful lot of data about us floating around. Some of it is given by us and some of it is taken without our knowledge. And how people use our data is in targeting. So imagine people are divided into two different groups called buckets, the target group and the non-target group. The target group is often something you're trying to identify so that you can sell them something. And the ways in which vendors go after people can sometimes be quite worrying. So let's do a thought experiment. So I have two buckets. The green bucket is the target bucket. The red bucket is everybody else. I'm not sure yet how big these are relative to each other, but we'd say for the time being that they're quite small. And imagine the people in the green bucket are responsible for 90% of murders in the world and 99% of rapes. Now imagine we could identify this group of people. We would probably want to do something about them. Now it turns out we can identify these people. And these people are known as men. <laughs> Now the difficulty with this, of course, is that the proportion of men who are non-murderers is much higher than those who are murderers. And what we have here is a confusion matrix. It's a way of identifying how well a machine learning algorithm is performing. So in this case, the true positive rate is people who are murderers and who have been correctly identified as being murderers. So if we just select men, this will be a very high rate. False negatives are people who were murderers but who weren't identified as such. Now using this method, we would get a fairly good score on this, simply because most murderers are not women. Next we have the true negatives, and these are people who are not murderers and are not identified as being murderers. Now this is a fairly mediocre score here, because none of the female murderers would be identified. The final thing we have then is the false positive rate. These are people who are identified as being murderers but who are not murderers, and in this case we're a disaster because so many men are going to be identified as being murderers, even though they're not. So in terms of buckets, the proportion of men who commit these murders is tiny, so that bucket is minuscule. And what we're going to talk about in this section is situations like this, where we have a very small target group that advertisers are going after in a really aggressive way, or a situation like this, where a bucket is so general that a large number of people are being pulled into that bucket simply because they look like the real targets in some superficial way. I'll start with a very benign example of recommender systems. Okay, and we'll talk specifically about Netflix. So here are my five favorite films. Now, if you look at my Netflix history, what you'll find is that there are other movies in there as well. And this is a fairly common phenomenon, which is well documented. Here's a nice book called Everybody Lies, which describes how differently we behave online to how we behave in real life. Here are the movies that Netflix has recommended to me based on my viewing history. <laughs> so again, in terms of buckets, we have one bucket who are people like me, who enjoy these sorts of movies. <laughs> and your other bucket are people who don't. <laughs> these monsters do exist. Yes. Their success metric is a confusion matrix. And in this case, the true positive rate is very high, as is the true negative rate, meaning that most movies they suggest, I do want to watch. And because of this, they will end up profiting. And this is reasonable enough. They give me a good service, I can withdraw from it at any time. But it's not that easy to walk away from all systems. Here's a predictive search from Google. Now, this is a search I produced using a browser in incognito mode in Limerick. So the suggestions are not necessarily the kind of thing that I would have searched for, but more what Google thinks that people in Ireland will search for. <laughs> Some of these are quite negative. Especially men. We do sign up are quite angry, especially with our wives. And this leads to micro-targeting. We're telling Google all sorts of things about ourselves. 
We're telling Google things we would never tell other people, and this information is going to be used against us. <laughs> sometimes this manifests itself in ads for useless things. Although in fairness, sometimes we see ads for genuinely useful and tasteful items. But other times it's sinister. Sometimes people are targeted because they are in vulnerable positions, because they are poor, or because they need an education. We tell Google all sorts of things, especially things we are worried about or things we are ashamed of. And this ad is sold and used to target us to sell us services. Vendors can build profiles of us based on things we're concerned about. They know where we live and, because of cookies, what other sites we've been to. And when they come after us, they do so in a very aggressive way. And this is a big problem. People are being sucked into buying goods and services that they either don't need or not what they're advertised to be, and oftentimes that they can't afford. And the big problem here is that profit is a success metric. It doesn't matter if the end customer made use of or even needed the service. The king of micro-targeting is Facebook. Okay, so Facebook, they get to control even who sees your messages. So intuitively, you might think that if you post a message, so if you post an article from one of these respected websites, these respected websites, you might assume I would see that if I'm one of your friends on Facebook, and I probably won't. And that's because I primarily use Facebook for looking at adorable pictures of kittens <laughs> or reading stories about disappointments sports teams. It gets even more unpredictable for hot topic issues, especially political ones, because these are often the articles that Facebook is eager to push. And again, because their success metric is profit, it's the one thing they care about. And to make things even worse, the angrier people are, the more likely they are to click on something. And this has led to real problems in the US where there's a real issue with misinformation. Now I'm going to change topic slightly and talk about data. So actually these are my data samples from which I train my machine learning models. Now if the data is linear separable, it means it's easy to distinguish between our two buckets. So for example, if we were able to use height, so everybody above six foot is tall, everybody who's below it is not. Now generally, it's not that easy. The data is more like this that's much more difficult to distinguish between the target and the non-target groups. Related to this is the notion of data sampling. And oftentimes we've got so much data, we can't use it all to train at the same time. And there's a skill to choosing your data. So if we pick all the data from here, then clearly we're going to bias the data because all of these samples will look the same. So intuitively, you might want to pick something here in the middle. But there are risks, okay, because we also have outliers which might look different from those samples right at the center. Now, if instead of having something like this, we instead had something that looked a bit more like this, where all of one type of data is clustered in the middle, and if we then chose our sample from here, now this would be a spectacularly bad choice of data for training. And unfortunately, this is what's going on at the moment, particularly when it comes to facial recognition. And it turns out that autonomous vehicles are more dangerous to you if you're not a white male. Here's one result in particular. This is facial analysis software has an error rate of 0.8% for white men and 34.7% for dark-skinned women. Okay, this is just horrifying. As it led to the coining of this phrase, pale male data, to indicate the level of bias that's been used in the data for training. Now, as someone who comes in at the high end of the pale male scale, okay, somewhere between the scary monk from the Da Vinci Code and the White Walker, well, maybe up here, I welcome the fact that I'm unlikely to be knocked down by an autonomous vehicle, but it is clearly unacceptable that there's such a bias. What we have is this, prejudice in, prejudice out, because the data sets of bias. And here's what we have. The further we go, the worse this is going to get, because it is completely automated. So what we have is weaponized data, and there's three big areas at the moment that are problems. So one is justice, social welfare, and recruitment. And I'm just going to look at justice for the time being. What we have here is known as Compass software. This is used to predict how likely somebody is to commit another crime. And a study was done to see how different it treats black people compared to white people. It predicts low risk pretty similarly for both black and white people, but it's quite different for the medium to high risk people. Now, when this appeared in the news, we don't gather information about race. And this is true. Here's a copy of the form that they get people to fill out. So there's some personal details, but there's a bunch of other questions as well spread across various categories. And the problem here 
is that some of the questions that are asked in these categories are what is known as proxy data. So we're not specifically asking what race somebody is, or what gender they are, or what their poverty level is, but we can infer it quite easily from this data. And there have been a lot of studies showing just how dangerous this is, even when companies don't realise that they're doing it. So here's what's happening. We have models that think black people are more likely to be criminals, men make better employees, and that poor people are lazy. And it gets even worse. We also have some poor quality models. This study looked at the equivalent data from earlier on. And what they wanted to do was to compare how the Compass software performed against humans. And they did two different studies. They had humans who didn't have access to the race of the person, and humans who did have access to the race of the person. And these are humans who had no training in criminology. Now the surprise here was that humans were as good as a computer, if not better. But what was disappointing is that they were about as racist as the computer. And this shouldn't be a surprise, because a model was trained on historical data, and historical data reflects what humans think. And what's terrifying here is that these models are being used in courts, and they're what is known as black box models, meaning they're completely opaque and we don't understand what these models are doing. This is why the generative models are worrying, because even the people who created them don't know how they work. Sadly, ethics are kind of taking a back seat at the moment, because there's such a push to make progress with these models. The broader talk here was about what teaching machines to learn can teach us about ourselves. What machine learning is doing is holding up a mirror to our own vices. Here are all the things we are tolerating as a society. We have biased data, we have opaque models, people being treated unfairly in a mechanized way. So what can we do about this? And by fair, I mean fairer than society currently is. The first thing we need to do is to get rid of the black box. There has been some work towards this, especially on explainable AI. And some of that work has been done here in UL. There also needs to be regulation. And fortunately, the EU is leading the charge with this. And what they're trying to do is come up with a list of risks where it is acceptable to use machine learning. But we also need to understand the data, because this is where the problem is. OK, so we have data that is sexist, classist and racist. So it's no surprise that when you generate model based on that, they are sexist, classist and racist. And we have to remember that models are always wrong. So to take what the EU have here, what we have to do is make sure that there's always a human in the loop, particularly when the model is going to make a decision about another human being. I don't know where that level comes in. Maybe it's somewhere low down, or maybe you say the highest. Every time a machine makes a decision about a human's well-being, then another human must be involved. Thank you. A lot of people helped making this presentation. Alan DeLima, who worked on the World Happiness Index experiments. Gauri Vaija made all the data visualization graphs. Colin McGettrick shot the video. Tony Irwin helped with the audio here tonight. Meghna Shasagar created the LDC RC slide. Siobhan Harris arranged everything. Heather Gardens did absolutely everything else. I also want to thank the BDS group. There are my faculty members. This is JJ Collins, Richie Conway, and Joe Sullivan. We have a fantastic group of postdocs in the BDS group. That's Sarmid, Meghna, Douglas, Darian, Raj, and Yao. And also all of the postgrads. Here are a list of all our references. Here are my contact details. And here are links to the software that we've used. These are versions of grammatical evolution that are free, one in Python and the other in C.